Life lesson learned today. Never record an episode directly after a Red Wings game. Oh yeah, this is depressing. I no longer have the urge to talk about anything to do with the Red Wings for the rest of today. We went into that thinking that we would have something, like we would be better tuned to the game, be some kind of natural transition from what we were watching into this episode. Oh, jeez. It was like... We've watched Red Wings games this season, most of them, but this was worse. Nothing. At, the it said the shots on goal were close to seventy combined between the two teams, and I can remember like three of them. It feels like nothing happened in that game, and yet the Red Wings still somehow blew a third period lead. Mind you, uh, thank you to all Patreon patrons who tuned into our um, live stream. That was something that we're going to do uh, for patrons at least once a month. Uh, it's an exclusive thing for them. Um, I think we at peak we had about 20 people logged in, so yeah. that was fun chatting with you guys, watching the game with you. Um, Hopefully next time we won't be angry from before the game even starts. You weren't angry, Brad. You were sad. Oh no, it was both. And with that, welcome to the Wing Wheel Podcast. I'm Ryan Hanna. I'm angry. I'm Evan, <laughs> also known as Sleepy. Oh, I was going to make that joke. Damn it. <laughs> Damn it, Evan. God. Uh, on today's docket, we are going to talk about things where if Brad pulls out any modicum of, of positivity, it will be a legitimate miracle upon which he can be canonized. Uh, we'll be talking about the lottery standings, a.k.a. the reverse standings, a.k.a. the only playoff race Detroit's in, a.k.a. reality. And then we'll be AKA talking about... A, the only source of optimism we have. And then we'll be talking about... The trade deadline, Holland. I don't know, random stuff before overtime. It's going to be a mishmash of sadness this episode. Can we talk about how Fox Sports Detroit did a segment on Dennis Jalowski's family in his homecoming game? Yeah, why is that weird? Why is it weird? I don't know, Ryan. This seems like a perfectly, perfectly natural story to do. An NHL rookie having a phenomenal season, playing his first ever NHL game in his home province. The one time the Red Wings are visiting his home province this year. Huh. Yeah. Seems like a perfectly good story that you'd want to air, like, you know, first intermission while everybody's eyes are going to be on. Or maybe, for reasons, you have to put it to after the broadcast. Because reasons. Those reasons being that Dennis Chalosky was a healthy scratch. For this game, the only game where Detroit plays in Vancouver around where Dennis Chalosky is from for this season. In his rookie season, his breakout season, who is arguably a top, arguably a top five rookie in the NHL this year. <laughs> Woo, we agree. Um, that you you talk first, because when I talk, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to stop for thirty minutes. Hey, look at that. We've grown as podcasters. the The thing about this is, is this is um, this has all the ingredients for this to be. Uh, one of those situations where we get super angry about something like we just kind of blow something out of proportion because it's a talking point and we're a podcast and we're talking heads and it's going to seem way worse than it is because we have to fix it up, fix it on it for a set amount of time. Hey, entertainment value is something you have to factor in a podcast. 100%. Why do you think we have the Mike Milbury Minute? And we, Sometimes. and we, we, oh, this, this should be a Mike Milbury Minute. No, I need more than a minute. This isn't even a candidate for the damn it. Um... And we know that, and we try to qualify when we do that. It's just the reality of doing what we do. I'm confident in saying this isn't one of those situations. This is truly, I don't want to say a failure of, of Jeff Blashell as a coach, because that would mean he was in contention to not be a failure of a coach up until this point. <laughs> and that seems harsh, but how do you, as a coach of a losing team, take what is one of your best young players, the guy having a breakout rookie season one by all rights, he shouldn't have been having one, out of the game in favor of... It was at least Philip Hironic. It was at least Philip Hironic, yeah, but he corrected his little Hirono from last game. You took him out of the game in the one game where he was going to be playing essentially in his hometown. A game that means a lot to... Now what... it. Yeah, maybe his play has tapered off and they want him to work on some things. I don't think the healthy scratching Dennis Chalosky would have been a good idea at any point this season considering how he's playing. If he's tapering off, I think you more have to work on that in practice or, you know, ask the coaches to fix it. Sitting him isn't going to... 
regardless of what Sidney will do. On the game where his family had bought tickets months in advance to go see their family, like the pride and joy of the Cholosky family, go play NHL hockey in his breakout season as a star for the Red Wings, and you healthy scratch him. And they said, oh, we feel terrible about it. Don't do it. This is a terrible hockey team. They're a lottery team. Literally none of these moves matter. Why are you taking this away from them? Why on earth would you take this away from them? So, all year, for years, plural, I've been all over Jeff Blackshill. I would argue I'm his biggest critic. If I'm not, I truly applaud anybody else who's given him more flack than me. But over the last few years, I've understood one thing. I hate calling for people to be fired because I understand this is a person. Jeff Blaschel is a person with a family. I don't think he's trying to tank the Detroit Red Wings. I don't think he's trying to do anything that's in the bad interest of the Detroit Red Wings. I think he's just bad at his job. It doesn't mean he's a bad person. It's the same thing for when we criticize Justin Ablocator or Jonathan Erickson. We do, we, they are probably terrific people. But like Ryan alluded to, this is a dick move. I no longer feel that little bit of guilt I feel in the back of my brain for how often I rag on Blash Hill for the poor job he's doing because I've just been ragging on him for the poor job that he's been doing. He he pulled the rookie, the the biggest story, arguably the best story of the Detroit Red Wings this year, and scratched him. If if Jeff Blashill truly believed that Dennis Cholosky needed to sit a game, I disagree with that. But if he did, it's an 82 game season. This was his one. This was his one hometown game, and it's not like Dennis Cholosky has been a frequent scratch. This is the first time in his NHL career he's been a healthy scratch. So you can justify it. And again, if a team is in a playoff race or contending for first overall, like first overall in the standings to get home ice advantage, by all means, do whatever you think is best for the lineup. Okay, If that means scratching, if the Red Wings were sitting in ninth place in the Eastern Conference right now and Blasio legitimately thought that we need to, these two points and scratching Cholosky is going to do that, by all means, sit him. It matters. This season is right off. The Detroit Red Wings are now second last in the entire NHL. And you sat him. That is an asshole move of Thanos proportions. It. I'm not even going to get into what this means in a hockey from a hockey perspective because I made all the exact same points in last week's episode where I said, if you're trying to win, scratching Philip Hronik was stupid. If you're trying to develop the team, scratching Philip Hronik is stupid. So, if you're trying to win, scratching Dennis Cholosky was stupid. If you're trying to develop the team for next year, scratching Dennis Cholosky was stupid. This man is the worst coach in the NHL. And this is in a league where Randy Carlisle just lost 12 games in a row and still has a job. Jeff Blashill might be the worst coach the NHL has seen in the last decade. The team regresses. They have no system. They have three players that are just barely keep, keeping them afloat. A goalie who just looks broken inside and yet is still somehow putting up a 9-15 save percentage or whatever it is. It's The Red Wings are no longer watchable. It's hard to root for a team that is actively working against for themselves. It is, again... I have been, not not necessarily Ken Holland's biggest fan, but I've been a Ken Holland apologist over the last couple of years based on the recent job he's said, done. If Jeff Blashill is anywhere near this team by the time the month of May rolls around, I retract every good thing I said about Ken Holland. He's immediately a failure as a GM to me. This is counterproductive to everything the Red Wings should be doing right now. Now, some people are making jokes, and rightfully so, Hey, Jeff Blashill is the right coach for us because he's tanking us right into Jack Hughes. You're not wrong. He is absolutely contributing to us getting a very good pick. But at what in cost? We're it's, hurting her on the internet, Brad. I know. I'm trying to scale it back. At Cholosky's development's cost? At Heronic's development's cost? At Rasmussen's development? Go on and on and on. And he pulled the same crap. Who knows where Anthony Mantha would be right now with a proper coach? 
Who knows where Andreas Athanasiu would be right now with a popular coach? It took both of them very long to really get their NHL legs, and now they're producing not necessarily at the level we hoped they would, or I still think there's a lot more in there for Anthony Mentha, but they're not. At what point do we say getting the high draft pick is not worth the damage Jeff Blaschel is doing to this team? So I, uh, quote unquote, broke the news on the Red Wings subreddit. Don't read the comments. Don't read the comments, bro. Oh, you don't re- uh, don't read the comments. I don't read the subreddit anymore. I okay. can't. I just can't. Oh, there's a lot of people who agreed with the move. No, a it's... A lot of people who agreed with the move. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and, you know, there's a reason those people I'd say it was like energy. 65, 35. There's people who just will agree with whatever the organization does because they're blind, loyal fans. Which, hey, to a certain extent... God, I wish I was right now. (laughs) Yeah, to a certain extent, good on you. If that's what's going to keep you happy as a hockey fan, by all means. It means your opinions are wrong and bad, but hey, whatever gets you through the season, by all means, take that approach. Just maybe don't post it in public because people will judge you for being wrong and stupid. But it's just... Again, object- this season is a write-off. I don't even care. Well, I care. But I don't even care if this was the right hockey move. It was just a dick move. This is the type of shit a player like Dennis Chalosky will remember when his next contract comes up. When his contract after that comes up. He'll be like, I'm not taking a hometown discount. You guys fucked me around. I'm not signing an ex- a long-term extension with you. The second I get to unrestricted free agency, I'm gone. Like, this is the stuff that... Not that this one instance would be the backbreaker, but you get another instance like this. You get another one, and another one, and it just drives people out of town. Look at Ottawa. Death by a thousand cuts, and eventually air crossing out the point, I don't want to be anywhere near this team. It's garbage like this that's going to hurt the franchise long long term. I'm going to push this a little bit further, because you said if Ken Holland extends Blashill you would then write off Ken Holland in your mind. Does Ken Holland not have any semblance of responsibility at this point to stop this move from it's, happening? So this, that's a touchy subject, because I'm of the mindset, generally speaking, you let the people in the positions do their job. You put them there, you should have faith in them, yada, 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 let them do their job. We don't like when owners meddle, we don't like when CEOs meddle, we don't, you don't meddle down the chain. You just check in to see how progress is going. So if Ken Holland wanted to have some input into who's coming up and down from Grand Rapids because there's like salary cap implications and all that kind of stuff, like if Flash Hill wanted to call Zadine up next week and Ken Holland says no because we need him to play less than 10 games because expansion draft, whatever, that's fine. But no, I, I, I agree that as a GM you should let your coach coach, okay? I, if I'm Ken Holland, am not going to step in. Because if I'm Ken Holland and I get to the point where I feel that my coach is doing such a bad job, I have to start recommending things him for him to do. That's the point I fire my coach. That's just, you either trust the guy to do his job or you don't trust him and you can't employ him. I'm, I'm not going to dig too deep on my position on this because it's not a secret that I'm a big proponent of the, the team moving on from Ken Holland in the general manager position. Um, but, just for the record, I think it's worth stating that this shouldn't be a surprise that Jeff Blasio made this move. This isn't... No, I, I predicted this on Twitter a week ago. Yeah, you said it. it, it I called this, that Chalot, that if they're willing to scratch Ronick in a... I forget what the exact tweet said, but if they're willing to scratch Ronick after putting up five points in five games, they're absolutely going to scratch Chaloski. I think I mentioned when Daly came back because of Jan, but it didn't even take that long. Like, I called that this garbage was going to happen because there is... Zero accountability to veterans on this team. None. Zero. And even if there were, Jeff Blashill has no idea what it takes to win a hockey game in the NHL. None. The thing about it is, you predicted it. It's completely in line with everything Jeff Blashill has done up until this point. Why has it been allowed to go this long? Yeah, no, that's what I mean. If, if Holland's mentality is, you know what, this season's a write-off anyway. It's probably best to not rock the boat at this point. We're just going to replace him at the end of the year. I don't agree with that, but I can understand it. No, I don't agree with it, but I can understand the logic there. But if Blashill is the coach of this team next year, it's going to be 
the biggest failure in this organization in the last 40 years. If you put... Especially with where we're projecting the draft. Exactly. You could put money down on Jeff Blashell being the coach after this season. You might cash out. I would I would put money on that. If you told me I had to make that bet, I'm betting on him coming back. Yeah, that's pretty sad. The And it's bad. I like in, in no reality would I ever be one of those fans that oh I'm gonna boycott this team because it's so stupid, but no, I'll still watch the team, I understand that, but it might be a season where I don't put any of my money towards them. Don't buy I don't buy tickets, I don't buy merchandise. No, I some form of protest, be like, you're gonna make this worse for us, I'm not gonna help. Just go watch it and wait uh, a Buffalo game or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So since the last time we spoke, uh, Detroit lost to Calgary 6-4, and then of course lost uh, tonight to Vancouver 3-2 in regulation both games. Uh, both games had showed blown leads in, in the third, third period. How many goals did Cal- uh, Calgary score in the third? Four? Three? Like that. No, it's brutal. Uh, Detroit is now sitting 30th out of 31 teams. Uh, LA has a game in hand, so Detroit very well might be LA last in the league. Tonight, I don't think. No, they don't. Dead last. And what's the common theme with all the teams around Detroit in the standings right now? They have all fired their coach this year. LA has. Chicago has. Philly has. I mean, it, at what point do you just not look and go, how? How do we? How do we not do this? How do you not? You have Dan Bilesma on your staff. You have a seasoned NHL coach ready to step in. Even if Bilesma is not your long-term solution, he is more than capable of manning the ship the rest of the year. I'm I'm of the mind that Bilesma is not the right answer for Detroit. Long-term, no. I tend to agree. But if he's the answer... Ryan, if we implemented you as coach for the rest of the season, it's an improvement. Jonathan, just play defense. What's wrong? Why are you like this? That'd be me as a coach, John oh, Fenner. I, th- I don't think if you were a coach, I don't think John Fenner nice plays a game, to be fair. That's the nicest thing you could say to him. Uh, Detroit, between now and our next podcast, will play Edmonton um, on the 22nd, which, will, of course, will feature um, Detroit Red Wings players uh, or slash future Edmonton Oilers players in exchange for the first-round pick. Um, Pooley Harvey played a ton of minutes last night. They're showcasing them. Uh, and then Detroit goes on a little bit of a break. They have a week, one one week, a week and a half off. Oh, thank God! Before they play Toronto on Friday, oh, February first. Um, Remember, bloody Friday, February first. Yeah, for real. Um, so they uh, we'll have some podcasts where uh, there won't be so many games to talk about. So Brad might be a little bit happier. Yeah, we'll talk about the rest of the NHL where teams and fans are actually enjoying themselves. Yeah, honestly. Uh, so so the Detroit Red Wings are pretty firmly in the lottery race. Um, things that are going well right now, Mantha looks very prominent out there. He's had a few games in a row where he's looked active uh, since he's been back. He's up to 12 goals now. We did pre- predict this to, this for him to be a 30-goal season. He did have a slow start, and he has missed some time yeah, due he missed to injury. Yeah, a month, didn't he? So, and he's going to get a lot of goals. Th- Jack Hughes is feeding him the puck. Yeah, I for real. I think, if I did the math, based on his goals per game, he's, out, he's on pace for somewhere around 27 if it were an 82-game season. So, better. That's not bad. Yeah, it's okay. It's a, a smaller season than what we would have liked to have yeah. seen from him, but slow start. But And also, I do think with a proper coach, we will see a step forward from more than a few players on this team. Yeah. Just now, is not one of them. No? That commercial... He might actually. He might. That, that, I, that commercial is actually jokes. I saw that commercial for the first time. Was it's, that today? It was the first time you saw it? Yeah. Just now, yeah, the has four goals this year, and they showed three of them, and one of them was an empty netter in that commercial. And it's all his teammates talking talking nicely about him, for those who haven't seen it, and not one of them do they mention anything about his skill as a hockey player. They said he is an important uh, part of the team's success, and then I looked at the standings, and it took me three swipes to find us. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, hold on, because they... Uh, I gotta double check because my favorite part about that is they showed three Justin Ad locator goals from this year. Brian Rafalski was I'm in one pretty of them. sure. Oh, he's got five now. So they showed uh, what's that? Sixty percent of his goals for the season in that one thirty second commercial. Oh my God, Luke Glendening has more. I enjoy Luke Glendening more as a Luke, hockey player. Luke Glendening is a better hockey player in every aspect of the game of hockey than just an advocator. Yeah. And he's about a third of the price. And yeah. half of the term. Um, 
the Red Wings, we keep pushing them to be big sellers at the deadline. They had a segment where Ken Allen was talking about he's hoping by the time he gets this question in 2019-2020, which is literally just next season, so I don't know why he's talking about it like it's far away. Um, he's hoping they're in a position where they might be buyers. Well, that is, we all hope for that too. And I also hope that I'm going to win the lottery that I didn't play this week. That is delusion. That is pure fantasy. What was the question? Uh, they were asking whether Detroit was going to be a seller or a buyer. Okay, so what did he say for this year? He said they were looking to move assets. I What's he going to say? Be like, we're looking to sell well, next year too? No, no but we do have to understand when like Ken Holland talks in the media, he can't ever actually say anything. Right when they're like, we're gonna we're gonna try and move Howard or Nyquist, but uh, first is our price. What, what else is he gonna say? Yeah, no, we're gonna eventually like settle for a third. Yeah, we'll no. take anything. Yeah, no, you're not gonna say that. It's you have to understand. A GM can never actually say anything, so you always take Ken Holland's quotes with a grain of salt. But if he actually thinks his team might be able to compete next year, boy howdy, I love his optimism. I love his outlook on life. But uh, you will be wrong, son. Even if Jack Hughes comes in and Philip Zena come in, guns a blazing. You're not a buyer at the deadline next year, Ken. You are maybe a seventh or eighth seed. At best. We already have enough depth players who can't score. Yeah, because actually the, the big long article that Max Boltman and Dom Luchishin put put out about where what's Detroit's realistic scenario to be good in the what was it, twenty one twenty two season or twenty twenty one season? Um where certain players using a model that Dom created based on the projections, how good they would be, yada, 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 where they would project in a lineup, who would have to come out of the lineup to be good, and where your holes are. The very reassuring thing was Detroit actually came in very nicely on the depth chart, like their third line. Projection third line was actually unreal. It was like Bertuzzi, Rasmussen. Um, no, Rasmussen was even on the fourth line that had so much depth in that model. But they were missing a second line center and a first line winger. They were missing two top four defensemen. So, oh god! <laughs> but depth, the depth looked real good. So well, that's they, what happens when you don't have any top end talent. So if they get a Jack Hughes or a Capo Caco in the draft that takes care of one of those two uh, top six forward positions that they needed to fill, they sign a Mark Stone or Matt Duchesne to fill the other hole. Just I'm just spitballing names here. Um, in the next draft, they draft one of the defensemen and find another defenseman in free agency. It, it's doable. Yeah. It's not likely, but it's it's very much in the realm of possibility. There was uh, but, some talk that Duchesne was most likely resigning in Ottawa. For the, the number was eight or nine at the start. Million, yeah. Same with Mark. Thousand? Eight or nine thousand? <laughs> That's but, it? But, um, but what was the point I was getting to? But the point I was getting to was the model also dropped a ton of current players who are on the team off the roster. So I wish I, I wish we could do that so on just a daily basis. Yeah, so Helm wasn't there, DeKaiser wasn't there, Cronwell, well obviously Crosswell won't be there. But yeah, so it's there's gonna there's gonna need to be heavy turnover in the offseason and it can't just be the roster. Abdul Kader is the thirteenth forward in that forward in that model and I think that's just because they his contract goes up yeah, until the end of time. Yeah, he's on the roster, so you got to put him somewhere. Mm -hmm. He uh, that was also, I think, Franz Nielsen's last year, and they had him listed as the fourth line center. They had Zadina Larkin, Mantha, Athanasiu, some kind of first rounder, Stone, Rasmussen, Valeno, Bertuzzi, Berger, and Nielsen. Special Wait, Mark player. Stone. Yep. Yeah, they were projecting like what type of player they would need to sign to fill oh, one of the I holes. See. So, because they, they were they were so what was the first line they had on the the projection? Larkin, Zadina, Mantha. Yeah. Then the second line was Athanasiu. Athanasiu with two holes they would need to fill. I think one of the main talking points Max had in there was where Detroit's going to be picking in this draft and where this draft draft strength are. Is this is where they're likely going to address that center position, whether it's Jack Hughes, Kirby Dock, Dylan Cousins, whoever. Um, they can likely fill that here. Mind you, if they pick Kako or whoever, then they have to sign a center instead of Mark Stone. Whatever splitting hairs there. So they have two big holes in the top six, but the bottom six filled out really nicely with, like Ryan mentioned, Valeno, Bertuzzi, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, uh, Dom's model is very kind to uh, Philip Peronik on the projection, though. They said he'd be a legit number two defenseman, um, so to tr and Chalosky a legit number three, so they needed to fill the number one and the number four slot on don't defense. Don't we all? Don't we all? 
But hey, when you like we where Detroit's defense was a couple of years ago, if if realistically the two and the three will are filled, that's probably yep. better than we thought where they thought they would where we thought they would be right now. Yeah. Now here's the thing, that model is contingent on Zadina progressing to a first line winger. Uh, I think they had him projected as a second line winger I, 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 based on the stats. They just put him on the first line because they had to. Uh, it's contingent on, of course, Valeno's development, continuing Bergeron, progressing to an NHL oh, player. Oh, they had Bergeron on the roster? I didn't know. So. Fourth line, mind you. Fourth line. Sveshnikov being viable in the fourth line, yeah. and uh, Nielsen not falling completely off a cliff. Which it's doesn't all, look like he has. So. It's also contingent on whoever their first rounder is hitting. Hitting, being a viable second line center, and getting someone like Mark Stone. But the, also, the nice thing with the model is it projected a lot of the prospects missing. They didn't have to put a ton in there to make this work. So even if they go 50% on the prospects that we expect to make the team making it, we're good because on defense, the only the only defenseman they had in there that isn't already on the roster was McIsaac, right? Uh, I think so. Yeah, so th that's positive. So if only... McIsaac succeeds out of McIsaac, Sari RV, Sulak, um, Hicketts, uh, Lindstrom. That's that's a good problem to have, right? Right, so. but there's it's still the fact that this team mm. is two to four big moves away from contention. But that's what I mean. We're looking at a, a projection that is two or three seasons out. So it's not like Detroit has to go fill all four of these needs. This summer, no. They can tackle two of them here. So if they can do one key free agent signing and one key draft pick each year, they're there. Right. But what I'm saying is that that's not likely to happen in one year. And so no, no, people who think that this, yeah, for no. Ken Holland who think, yeah, next year you might be buyers, it's just not. This happening. is a 2021 projection. Remember that, guys. Yeah. So, but again, the the great takeaway from that is Detroit is looking very strong from a depth perspective. And based on the timeline here, it's not crazy to think that you can fill those four holes in that time frame, whether it's two or three years. Mm -hmm. You have four slots to fill. Again, if you if they just if they don't get Mark Stone, if they don't get Matt Duchesne, if they don't get Artemi Panarin for agency, but they do get a guy like Eric Carlson or Tyler Myers, okay, there's one of the four uh, one of the defenseman slots filled. They draft Kirby Doc, Jack Hughes, Dylan Cousins, whoever it might be. There's one of the there's the center spot filled. So then the next summer, they're looking for one more defenseman and a winger. That's not crazy. You can do that. And if your offense is strong enough, even though they're lacking that number one defenseman, as teams have proven, you can win with mediocre defense if your offense is strong. And if you're slotting, projecting Bertuzzi, uh, Rasmussen, and Valeno as your third line, which the model all projects to be borderline second line players, you're going to have a terrific offense. No, and again, that's plus adding a high pick this year. Because where Detroit's in the standings right now, I do think they're going to be able to fill a very key need at four with a very good player. So based on where they sit right now, they could not pick any lower than fifth, which means one of Jack Hughes, Capo Caco, Vasily Pod Colson, Dylan Cousins, or Kirby Doc would be a Red Wing if that's how the Red Wings have their top five. It's not a maybe. They would get one of them. Now, the thing about this model is I don't see the Red Wings achieving this slightly ideal lineup with Ken Holland at the helm, and I don't see this ideal lineup performing to the degree that it should with Jeff Blaschel behind the bench. With Jeff Blaschel, no, definitely not. But here's the thing. Here's the one thing where I don't think anybody can argue where Ken Holland is very strong. He's a recruiter. He... As bad as Detroit is right now, he still gets Mike Green to stay. He brought Mike Green. But the, the year Mike Green signed, he was the hottest commodity of all free agents. gives a shit if Mike Green stays? No, I'm just saying he has a history of being able to bring free agents to Detroit. He hasn't brought a big-name free agent to Detroit since who? Every big-name free agent who's been on the market has not even looked at Detroit. When, when Detroit was... It rhymed was to make a run at Stamkos. Much just Stamkos. So. Stamkos didn't even look at Detroit. But Holland what, does not have the reputation as a recruiter anymore, in my opinion. But mind. what was who was the last big free agent other than Stamkos? Detroit really took a run at. 
why haven't they taken a run at any big name free agents? Cap space issues that Ken Holland ran into. That's another issue, though. That's not the that that's not his strength. I'm arguing right now. Ken Holland's two biggest strengths: one, RFA signings. You can't take anything away from him. I think he's masterful at that. Yep. Two, drafting, and that's he has a, that's a bigger team. Yeah. But still, he's at the helm. You have to give him credit. I don't think he's a good recruiter, and I don't think he's a good assessor. And, and again, you can say what you want about the contracts of the players, but the year Mike Green was a UFA, he was the big fish. And I'm pretty. And the year Franz Nielsen was a UFA, he was one of the top three centers teams were looking at. So, and and one of those other three centers was Steven Stamkos. It is Nielsen's contract good? Not great, but it's far from egregious. Yeah, it's it's, it's too bad. long, but yeah. it's a good cap hit. He's a he's a forty to fifty, forty to fifty point guy. It's gonna be it's too long, so the back half of this is gonna be rough. But again, you have to overpay UFAs. In no reality can you get a UFA without overpaying. And even I understand that as much as I disagree with a lot of these contracts. Every team is willing to overpay these guys. So I, all I'm saying is, when we're talking about Detroit recruiting a big free agent or two over the next two summers, yeah, this is something Holland can pull off. Uh, Would I bet on it being the biggest of free agents? Yeah, probably not. Would I put money on Mark Stone or Eric Carlson coming here this summer? No, probably not, but one of the secondary guys... But then what's the point? Why Why are we just getting more Franz Nielsen's? You know, what's that going to do for the team? Because look at the model. We need we need a second line winger. We need a number a second-pairing defenseman. If that ends up... Or a second-line center. Let's say we draft Kakos, so we're looking for centers. If that ends up being Tyler Myers and... Let's assume his cap hit's not going to be crazy. Matt Duchesne. Those are both on the same tier as the first two guys in my mind. Uh, no, no. Tyler Myers is not on the same tier as Eric Carlson. <laughs> no, but if you're talking about Mike Green being a big fish, Tyler Myers is a bigger fish. No, oh, yeah, that I can definitely relate to. But that's what I mean. It's, it, just because you're not getting the biggest fish, you still have to fill those holes, and you're not going to be able to do it all through the draft and development. I'm not inspired at all that Ken Holland would A, be able to attain anyone who'd make, who'd really move the needle for Detroit in a good way, like you're not drafting someone who, or signing someone who's 32 years old or older, and B, that, he, that even if he did sign someone that the contract wouldn't be, like it, this isn't just a path into another terrible Holland contract. Yeah, but here's the thing. Now, here's the thing people have to remember this, because I know a lot of people saw $9 million a year for Matt Duchesne. I'd oh, pay him $9 million a year. It's on the high side, but here's the thing. It's only cap hell if the players who are holding up your cap suck. Nobody in Toronto is complaining right now about their cap hell because the guys creating the cap problems are A-level hockey players. So if we have to overpay to get a Matt Duchesne, if we have to overpay to get an Eric Carlson, I'm all in. Give them a, if they're even $2 million a year over the cap, over what their cap hit should be, let me say so if Eric Carlson is objectively worth ten million, and we give him twelve, okay? That means we have to drop a Luke Lindenning off the roster. The game that Eric Carlson gives us is well worth sacrificing the bottom of your lineup for that. I am all for overpaying these free agents, and guess what? Luxury Ken Holland has over the next two summers: cap space and lots of it. I agree with you on exa on what you just said, Brad. I do agree with you, and I, I think if we're talking about Franz Nielsen type players, and I go back to my previous point, yeah, no, I that's don't, not. I don't want to recruit that kind of. Player. I don't want a Franz Nielsen. I want top four, top six. And if you, I don't believe that he could be a, a, a persuasive recruiter of Matt Duchesne. But if he can, then yeah, I agree. Let's overpay. However, those contracts that the the team needs to start dumping. First of all, stop signing Thomas Vanek. Just stop doing it. <laughs> Please, for the love of God, stop. Yeah. They need to learn to not give Darren Helm nearly $4 million. They need to somehow go back in time and undo Justin Abdelkader's contract. Th there's too many of these little piecework contracts. Oh, yeah. this That was never Ken Holland's strength, and I'll never forgive him for those contracts. But, again, that's the point I've been making all year. It's, it's been two and a half years since one of those types of contracts have come down the pipeline from which isn't a long sample size, and it doesn't exactly fill me with confidence, but I can't dump on him for doing it recently because he hasn't. The Thomas Vanek contract was pointless, but it didn't really hinder the team in any way this year. It was... 
But why at A? I don't know. There's, no, there's nobody in Grand Rapids right now that I can say has to be up in Detroit right now. So Vanek is filling nobody's slot right now. Had Zadina been amazing and had Svechnikov not got injured, sure, I could see some problems there. But it was an easy cap hit to bury. So that those type of contracts, I whatever. All right. But with the like you said, the long term, we got we can't afford to lose a Darren Helm. We can't afford to lose a Jonathan Aries, and those type of contracts are yeah, that has to stop forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. The only reason I'm not wetting myself thinking about what will happen when Jonathan Erickson's contract goes comes up uh, to expire is the fact that I don't think Ken Holland will likely be the GM at that point. Because <laughs> if he's the GM when, when Jonathan Erickson's due for either an extension or to be let go, I legitimately think Ken Holland would accept him. I honestly believe that he would accept it him. It would not surprise me. He, he uh, thinks well. 38 is a viable age to be playing defense because Nick Lidstrom skewed his idea of how a defenseman can... And can again, Ken Holland's him. biggest flaw as a GM is loyalty. He doesn't want to ever lose his guys, no matter how mediocre to bad they are. And if he if he can break that habit, then I have a bit more faith. But until he actually does break that habit, which we don't really know because he hasn't had a guy like that, his contract expire in a while. So I don't know if that bug is out of his system. And that does fill me with a ton of worry. And again, with his loyalty being this problem and Jeff Blaschel's contract expiring, it does not fill me with confidence. I am not sitting here and saying, by all means, I think Ken Holland's the guy for the job and he's gonna be the answer. All I'm saying is, Ken Holland is a GM who's proven in the past. He may be able to take a couple big swings in free agency and hit a home run on one or two. Not, again, even the best GM in the league, you have a, f a fraction of a percent of landing one of these guys because there's 30 other teams throwing pitches at them, but He's done it before. Maybe he can do it again. Maybe. God, I want Eric Carlson, please. Yeah, for real. Uh, so the current standings right now in the NHL, we'll chat about that a little bit. Which, by the way, San Jose and Eric Carlson. And Ottawa and Matt Duchesne and Ottawa and Mark Stone have all started talking contract extension, and that just crushed me because all that news came out in a span of like 24 hours, and I was not ready to handle it. I Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Because yeah. those are probably out of all the free agents and then plus Tyler Myers are probably the four guys Detroit should be looking at the most. Mm -hmm. uh, so currently around the NHL, the Islanders are leading the Metro. Go figure, in the year we hold their second round pick. Uh, which is not what anyone predicted. Tampa Bay uh, has a 16 point lead in the Atlantic Division uh, over Toronto. Toronto has two games in hand, so you can call it 12 points if you want. Tampa Bay going on an absolutely unreal run right now. Uh, Montreal and Pittsburgh holding wild card spots with Buffalo, Carolina, and uh, New York and Chase. In the West, Winnipeg uh, leads the Central Division. Nashville right behind them. And then Calgary is atop the Pacific with San Jose and Vegas holding the other two division seats. Dallas and Vancouver in uh, wild card spots. Do you, do you guys, sorry, finish your thought. Oh, that's it. Okay. Um, did you guys see the Grand Rapids jerseys from last night? I think it was last night. Pure fire. If there was ever a reason for the Red Wings to have a black jersey, that was it. Oh, I love those jerseys. Those they jerseys were, are absolutely filthy. They're if, being auctioned off for so much, though. If, if Detroit's new thirds for next year are those... Oh, my God. Oh, yes. God, yes. Because I was ranting on the live stream about how I hate the, the, the black ice jerseys that every team has. Like, they're just abominations. But if you actually made a dedicated and properly designed third jersey for the wings and it was black and it looked like that oh yes whoever made please. that jersey just put it into red wings form and i'm i'm all on board i still prefer the ones for the grand rapids uh fan jerseys from a three years ago that had the gold incorporated into them those jerseys were filthy and that would be my ideal pick outside of the barber pole for detroit but uh do you remember those ones oh god no i don't remember anything from like Ryan, three days talking, ago. i'll try and find these oh i was just gonna finish the standings talk so at the bottom of the league uh, you have LA in 31st, Detroit in 30th, um, Chicago in 29th, Ottawa in 28th, New Jersey in 27th, and Philly in 26th. So those are your bottom six teams in the league right now. Brad is currently showing off those jerseys to Evan. Uh, what is the site? I don't know if I like them more, but I do like them. I think it's a little busy, but I yeah. think, but I, I do. 
I think with a couple tweaks, that could be disgusting yeah. as well. I think I'm going to do a tankathon simulation, just one right now. We don't have to go into like a mock draft or anything, but with Detroit, God, we can't start the tankathons already. With the second Detroit with the second highest odds, I just feel like doing one tankathon. So I'm just going to sim the lottery right now. And Detroit went down three spots. No. Oh <laughs> God, Ryan! With Arizona, Ottawa, Ottawa slash Colorado, and Florida taking the top three spots in LA. Did they put Ottawa in there, or did they put Colorado in there? They put Ottawa grayed out, and they put a narrow shoot pointing to Colorado because gotcha. they had their pick. So yeah, that's uh, that's not a good one. Maybe I may actually just end end it then. Yeah, that's what actually happens. Lose dozens for cousins. Oh man, that well, we're losing dozens. Don't worry. Let goals in for Pod Colson. So Detroit, as they stand, currently has a 38.8% chance at a top three pick, 13.5% chance at number one overall. LA, being first, like last in the league, has a 49.4 chance, so nearly 50-50 at a top three pick, and 18.5% at Realistically, overall. we're hoping for top two this year. That's, that's Top two is where I'm thrilled. That's the top tier. Top two is where you get it's essentially the variance that people thought there was between Nico Heischer and Nolan, pa Nolan Patrick. Right. Heischer turned out to be the better pick. Right, these, these are these are better players than Heischer. These are, they're better, but I'm, I'm saying like the difference between the two, especially with Kako's rise recently, uh, and this is coming from someone who's pretty skeptical about late risers uh, in draft rankings. So as soon as I, uh, it's funny too. As soon as I mentioned on last episode that Nolan Patrick, well, while well, still good, was not having the type of season you'd hope from a second overall pick. He scored two against Montreal last night. Yeah. Um, and then moving on from there, there isn't a ton to talk about. There's. Uh, oh, your dogs just dropped something upstairs. You keep talking. I'll figure out why that color was a hockey stick. Uh, Jake Gardner has been booed in Toronto. Oh yes, Leaf fans never change. Yeah, let me tell you, and, and Mike Babcock actually said it perfectly. Um, Except he compared him to Larry Murphy. Yeah, you that's know what? A bit of, that's a top, let's talk about hot takes. That oh. is a hot take, Ryan. Larry Murphy did get a lot of heat for how he played defense. Yeah, but Larry Murphy's also won Stanley Cups, and I believe he's a Hall of Famer, is he not? Uh, I think so. Yeah, he should be. Yeah. I think it's. Uh, I only say I think he is because I'm almost certain he is, but I don't want to be that guy who look it up. deals in definites without knowing. Larry Murphy, Hall of Fame, 2004. Look at that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I don't know if Jake Garner by the end of his career will be in the same league. No, but Jake Gardner is a very useful player for the Detroit or for the Toronto Maple Leafs to have. Oh yeah, he does some egregiously bad things at times, but I mean. Come on. You, you know exactly what you're going to get with Jake Gardner. I can understand Toronto fans' frustrations right now, but you have to understand you're in the middle, you're in the grindiest part of the season. You're not at the end of the season rush. You're not at the beginning of the season, which is where I just bring I think it's a deep fryer. Oh. <laughs> oh, for the chicken wings. I was like, oh, I feel like a steam like vacuum. Um, you're in the middle of the season grind. You're at game 50 or something like that. You have to understand that your players... Your team is going to go through some slumps. If you grab any five-game sample, they might be bad. I have no idea why Elite fans hate Jake Gardner so much. Just like, he's, okay, was it the was it the game seven last year? He just had an absolute train wreck of a game and it was yeah, minus, minus five. five. Yeah, that was. Uh... Okay, like I get it. Like guys, you know, have bad nights at the worst time to have them, and you know, he makes some bad plays here and there, but it's not something you boo a player over. Uh, Rotary fans can relate to Jake Gardner because we've had Jake Gardner before. We only called him Brendan Smith. Yeah, but we didn't With less boo offense, him. but... We didn't boo him. We thought about it, though. <laughs> we booed him online. Uh, we're currently talking about Jake Gardner, which means I think we've run out of content for this week, so I'm just going to push this to overtime early. Uh, we, of course, are going to start with uh, Patreon, where all of our patrons get their comments read out on air, guaranteed as our way of saying thank you for supporting the show. Uh, we will start with Antonio, who says, Hey guys, what was your favorite concert you've ever been to and why? Uh, I saw Jack White at the Masonic Temple Theater in Detroit, which was uh, an insanely cool concert. I thought I had two nights after that, though, which wasn't good. But uh, it, oh, and we have a visitor. We have hello, Mika. Mika. Hi. <laughs> You're getting tricky. Hold on. That's fine. You said hi to Daddy. Hi. Uh, Kaylin Wood says, Danny the Kaiser woke up or something. Sorry I've been in Nebraska, but keeping up uh, when I can, he seems like he's doing things that aren't akin to a trash can. Fill me in. He looked decent today. Danny the Kaiser's been having the same season he's been having all year, which is like actually not bad at all. 
Oh, wow. is that a lollipop? Yeah, wow, Mika, that's a lollipop. Can Dan can Danny DeKaiser have a lollipop? After that pass he had today. Yeah, yes, actually, he's earned it. Blast. That was a fantastic play. Uh, also, Larkin is good. It's cold here, and I want to be back in Tejas. Thanks and stuff. Cyril uh, Rubitsky says, Hey, guys, first off, I want to thank you for the excellent content. Thank you, Cyril. Uh, I think that you're a new patron, so welcome to the family. It says, after growing up in Metro Detroit, I've been living out of state for the past 10 years, and your podcast has helped me get back into the Red Wings and hockey in general. Oh, we have a new intro. Oh, Brad. We have a new intro. Um, I'm curious about what you think about uh, goals above replacement slash wins rep above replacement, specifically the diversion at Corsica.hockey. Uh, for the Red Wings, Jensen is rated as their most valuable skater this year, though Mantha is better on a per-game basis. Which was somehow, which was somewhat surprising to me. Additionally, Larkin does not rate particularly well by this metric at 129th in the league, and both Mantha and Jensen above him on the wings. Is the WAR model missing something with Larkin, or is his speed and flashiness making some uh, masking some of his weaknesses? Also, Erickson is the sixth worst place, worst player in the league by wins above replacement this year. That seems about right. Cheers and keep up the great work. Uh, so those two stats, I do generally tend to favor them. I think they're good tools for. A, a little bit of a broader lens. Um, you're going to run into some anomalies, but in general, I trust the trends I've come up with. As with any advanced statistic, I think it's still, there's a lot of room for improvement in the world of advanced statistics, and a lot of that comes from the statistics readily available, provided by the leagues. Um, people are doing, like Corsica and similar uh, services are doing what they can to the stats they have. Um, you have to consider a few things with Larkin. One, he gets an insane amount of ice time and he gets an insane amount of first line ice time, he gets an insane amount of um, high-end teammates as much as are, are available on the team. So, um, well, just, just, that locator. just by volume, he's going to produce, but that might not do well within those stats. Uh, Jensen being right as the most valuable skater, you have to. it doesn't mean he's the best player. It, there's, a, there's a bunch of different factors in there that someone more well-versed would be able to articulate in words than me. Um, but the trends that it dictates, they're talking about goals above replacement. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Um, are generally, like, I, I look upon them favorably. I think it's a good source uh, to, in terms of modeling a team, especially when applying it to the cap, that's a useful app, that's a useful tool. When it comes to the fantasy stats right now, because everything is interpretive and there's no set one that works, I factor all of them in and paint, paint a broader picture to try and form my opinion because you can you can look at expected shots or see expected goals for uh, like we were talking about with Gar and Moore and um, yada 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 and if a player is strong in all of them take it for what it's worth but a guy like Nick Jensen who will populate very well on um, the replacement level stats doesn't necessarily populate well on the expected goal stats so you can kind of couple that in and there you go you can split the difference so just because one stat says Nick Jensen's more valuable than Dylan Larkin doesn't mean the next one does. You just have to kind of interpret all the data however you want. Because the the above replacement stats I like, I use them. Um, individually, they're probably among the most valuable stats. But again, they don't, they can't possibly factor everything, and no stat can. That's the problem. Taylor Hunter says, "Hey guys, I'm heading out to the Red Wings versus Canucks game." Uh, wish me luck on the twenty dollars I bet against my dad. He's a super big Canucks fan. Sorry about that. Oops. Uh, did, well, what was the spread? Did he give you two? I hope it was Canadian dollars. Also, thoughts on the new episodes of Brooklyn Nine Nine? I'm garbage and I haven't watched them yet. Oh, fantastic! Absolutely love them. The first episode was way better than the last one, but still good. Uh, Joe Caboose one one nine Z Falzone says lived in my first house for five months. Basement flooded with doo doo water. Plumber fixed it. Five days later, flooded again. Turns out I got to tear up my front yard to fix it. Sad face emoji dot boohoo. Good news is this has all happened before I built my recording studio after I told, tore out the old basement. Oh, that, well, silver linings. So on that note, what's the poopiest outcome this year for the Wings? I prefer optimistic questions, but after this week. Oh, uh, that the Wings finish fifth last and get bumped down to eighth. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Jeff Blaschel resigns. That might be worse. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Chris Gatchel says, hey guys, I'm really surprised Ryan said my last name correctly. Oh, I hope I said it the same way this time. Uh, everyone usually screws it up the first time, but not you, Ryan. Hey, I do what I can. Uh, my question is, if you had to get rid of one of the young players, who would it be? I personally would choose Mantha. He reminds me so much of Franzen. Hell of a shot, but man's so inconsistent. As always, thanks for the show. Define young. 
Mantha, Athena, Siu, Heronic, Larkin, So Tulasi. under the age of 25? Yeah. Christopher N. <laughs> Cop out. Uh, <laughs> Evan, how about you? Do I have to give a real answer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, how old's Jacob Delarose? No. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Burnham says, since we're most likely to pick somewhere from three to six in this year's draft, who are the best players in that range? The only one that I'm very familiar with is Pod Colson because of his junior, World Juniors performance. Let goals in for Pod Colson. Yep. Pod Colson, Kirby Doc, Dylan Cousins, Bowen Byram tend to populate in that range more often than not. Uh, expect to see a, this draft's pretty wide open. Expect to see names like Cam York, Matthew Boldy. Cole Caulfield, uh, Alex Turcott, um, Philip Broberg start to jump up into like the top ten, maybe even top five ranges. I I know Corey Prodman loves Matthew Boldy. I think he has him like number three. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's going to be pretty wide open. I have my top five, but trust me when I say once you get past the pick two, it's it's interesting. Uh, Dan Bell says, hey, Jen, so why all of a sudden can Blasio not play both rookies in the lineup? I mean, I know it's because he's the anti-development coach, but come on. I don't know how he sells a job, and I'm worried that he'll get extended. That would suck so bad because he sucks also so bad. <laughs> Stupid Blasio. Anywho, Michigan basketball finally lost a game. 17-1 ain't too shabby. Should be a good spring for them. Won't be able to watch the stream today. I'm going to be going to a beer release. Yay, beer. My favorite concert was Green Day. Saw them at Wrigley Field. They sound just like they do in radio. Great concert. Cheers, guys. Uh, Chris Canal says, Hello, gentlemen. I've noticed over the last weeks, few weeks, has, Lu has Goose just lost all creativity? Feels like whenever he's on a one-on-one -on -one with a D-man on the rush, he just turns back and looks for the trailer, which isn't a particularly bad play. I just like to see him take the net more often. Confidence goes a long way in the game of hockey. Uh, also, I don't think this is being talked about a lot, but Bertuzzi may be having the quietest, really solid season of anyone on this team. On pace for around 20 goals and 40 to 45 points. Anyways, great work as always. Have a good one. Fantastic third line production. Uh, Rowan says, really enjoyed uh, Fox Sports Detroit having John Agrobnik on the other day. He's such a good guy and I'd like to see him on more often. My segue from that is, who, is, who in the last 20 years has been the most underappreciated Red Wing player? As weird as it, as it is given everyone's love for the Russian Five, Kozlov and Fatisov get overlooked a lot. Past 20 years. Uh, Kozlov Jesus. was going to be up there for me. Kozlov. So that's, now that that's been said. Um, two players which had big name value, and of course people loved at the time, but people looking back kind of forget the role in these successful teams. Uh, Brendan Shanahan. I <laughs> legitimately... I, I, Good <laughs> lord. I legitimately don't... I'm going to go ahead and say Steve Eiserman. No, yeah. but people Nicholas don't... Lidstrom. People looking back don't credit Shanahan with, with how much he provided for that Red Wings offense. And, oh man, in 2 again, this is... Brett Hall. Brett Hall! Yeah. Brett Hall in 2 He's on our fourth line, I think. Brett Hall, Boy Devereaux, and Pavel Datsu. Yeah. Bending the knee, you know, draw, like flexing that stick in half and acting as a line mate to Pavel Datsu, who he could not communicate with one bit. I don't know, I think he was an important guy on that team. It's not the answer. It's not a typical answer to that question, but just trying to get outside the box. I want to go with Brian Rafalski or Chris Chelios. Those were legitimate top pairing defensemen. That Can you guys pick one who's not a Hall of Famer. Oh, favorite? are we like, talking like we want to go bottom six? Okay. No, you don't have to go bottom six. Like it could be somebody who put up a, some solid points that nobody really thinks about anymore. I think one would Rafalski. be Yuri Hudler. Oh, he was terrible. No. <laughs> he had a, at least a, he had at least one thirty goal season. Oh, he could produce offense. He was just terrible at every other aspect of the game of hockey. Don Kasich. Oh, there we go. Jeez, Chris Osgood maybe. I mean, I he know, never won. I think he's rated pretty accurate. Really, I think people undersell him all the time. Yeah, I undersell him because he wasn't that good. Is he a Hall of Famer in your mind? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, Thomas Holmstrom. Dougie Brown. Dougie Brown was a key part of a lot of teams. I don't even know who that is. There we go. Back to back cups. I, I don't want to say Kirk Malpe. I don't feel good. No, we can't Malpe. say anybody from the grind line. It doesn't. Martin Lapointe, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I can see Lapointe. I don't know. Uh, Larry Murphy, thanks, Toronto. Yeah, jeez. Yeah, for real. Um, jersey time. Which current player's jersey would you like to own, and why is it elite top line, top liner Darren Helm? 
current player jersey like a Red Wing? Oh, yeah, I think he means Red Wing. Well, I'm waiting to buy a Larkin jersey until he has the C on it, so I'm going to yeah. just go with that. I'm about the same place. Yeah, I don't buy uh, jerseys for a bunch of losers. <laughs> Uh, Marissa said, I'm sure you already ranted about this for seven hours, but I'm just so mad about Chalosky being scratched. And I found myself having to debate with someone on Twitter who thought it was a good idea. Don't go on Reddit. They were saying he's been sloppy and his plus minus is a worse than the team and scratching bets over rookies won't help us, etc., etc. I was surprised to have to defend Chalosky to a fellow fan. I'd appreciate if he just said some nice things about him right now. He deserves better than this. Of course his defensive deficiencies are going to be prevalent. He's a rookie defenseman on an awful goddamn team. What did we expect? Anyways, he's the best passer on the team by a country mile. So, and his offensive instincts are better than any other defenseman on this team. I, I almost want to include Mike Green in that statement right now with how blah he's looked lately outside of that one goal against Calgary. Joshua Zura, sorry if I'm not saying that right, you're a new patron, so welcome to the family. Thank you so much for all your support. It says, hey guys, been listening since the post-draft episode, but just became a patron a week or two ago. In order to distract myself from how much of a cancer blush is on this team, I must look through the offseason. From least to most likely, how would you guys rank the following possibilities? One, Eric Carlson coming to Detroit. Two, Joel Quenville coming to Detroit. Three, Jack Hughes coming to Detroit. Four, Steve Eisner coming to Detroit. Okay. I rank those reverse order. Okay, so from least likely to most likely? Uh, yeah, least to most. Okay, so I think that's in order of least okay, to most. Okay, yeah, so it might just be. Yeah. Least likely would be... I'm just going to play the odds straight up here. I'm going to say least likely is going to be Jack Hughes. I'm just, it's a 13% chance. That's not great. You think there's a hot, you think Detroit has a nearly like. I think, I think there'll be five to six teams that are going to throw some real money at Eric Carlson, and I think Detroit's going to be one of them, so that gives them about a 20% chance. I would kill, I would kill Evan right here for a one in five chance at Eric yeah, Carlson. Yeah, uh, well, again, there's only yeah. so many teams that have the need and the cap space to do it, right? Well, so, it's at least 3%. Yeah, yeah, so I'll go Hughes, Carlson, Quenville, Iserman. I, from least, I, I'll go Carlson, Quenville, Hughes, Iserman. So you think there's like a sub 15% chance we get Quenville? Yeah. I, I don't do. think he's in, I don't think he's interested in coming to a team that still needs to be rebuilt. He, he walked into it with Chicago. Yeah, you're right, but now he's an established coach. Which, when was the last time a coach left? Man, he's kind of a he's, guy who would take over a team that's Mike lost Babcock's its way, a.k.a. the St. Louis. I mean, he he's from the Windsor area, man. If he wanted to come back and be a local hero and turn his, his local team around, man, that's there's a pull to that. And if he wins before Babcock does, oh that's my the God. ultimate middle finger. Oh, my God. I would... I would have to go to the hospital immediately because yeah. there's no way that erection lasts less than four hours. Yeah. Uh, we have time for some <laughs> questions from our Reddit thread. It says, uh, HBK2121 says, hey boys, quick question. What about Twitter? Anything on Twitter? Uh, no, none, nothing on the ask. Ask WWP, hashtag idiots, let's go. Hashtag ask WWP. Uh, HBK2121 says, hey boys, quick question that I don't think I've heard you answer before. Do you think the NHL needs to have a broadcast deal with ESPN to really blow, blow out its growth here in the States? Also, if the team of Blashell and Holland are our coach and GM on July 15th, I'm going to have to spend the rest of the summer following Chris Illich around, throwing slices of pizza hut pizza at him, yelling, your father would have hired Steve. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I don't think ESPN's a good purveyor of sports knowledge, but I, I understand what not. you mean in terms of like the mass media. I can only imagine yeah. how lucrative the deal is they have with the NFL, and if reducing the NFL's airtime, that's going to cost them far more than it would ever be getting from the NHL. Listen, ESPN has their purpose right now, and that is to let us know what Tom Brady and LeBron James are doing at all times. Uh, I know how many farts Tom Brady's had this week. We cannot show a Connor McDavid goal if it means we are going to miss LeBron James' outfit of the day. I was in I was in Midwest America for a week and saw zero hockey highlights. I saw three basketball highlights. Uh, I thought basketball was big. I lied. There is a Twitter question. It's from Matt Graff. It says, on a scale of 1 to 10... How upset should I be if the trade deadline comes and goes and no trades are made? Very. Ten. Very. Yeah, like the angriest Ten. emoji you can find. Ten. I'm not, again, we know who the trade candidates are, and I'll be happy if 50% of them are traded because that's about par for the course for most teams. Mm -hmm. um, which means, in my mind, at least two guys have to go. And if we hit anything less, if we hit one, I'm pissed, but I'm understanding. If we have less than that, I'm furious. Uh, KBud04 says, Hey Ryan, sorry you got blocked by Keats. Press F for respect. To pay respect. Uh, if Jeff La is Jeff Blashill trolling us by sitting Chalosky? Yeah. 
Uh, Talikas or Talikas says, "What hope? What gives you hope that the current batch of defense prospects won't become another Marchenko, Willett, Sproul, etc.?" I'm gonna be the dick here and say I don't. I'm not. I, in my head, there's no guarantee that that won't. Happen. Ronick and Chalosky have already shown us more than any of those guys ever did. Yeah. But they also have Jeff Blashill developing them. Yeah. So with a, with a proper coach, they might even take another step forward. Uh, Coltron57 says, "Put on your GM hats, boys." In this scenario, you're Ken Holland. You have Peter Shirelli on the phone. He tells you he'll trade Jesse Pugliarvi in exchange for a package to help the Oilers make the playoffs. What's your best offer? Best oh, offer straight up for Pugliarvi, based on what realistically what Edmonton needs. Um, and we're not getting any kicker with Pugliarvi. I think there would have to be, in terms of the pack. I would say Pugliarvi and add a cap dump and take. Uh, giving them Nyquist for Pugliarvi is not enough, but giving them Nyquist and Jensen for Pugliarvi is probably selling yourself a little short. So if there's a second or a third round kicker in there, sure. So I guess if I really had to narrow it down, Nyquist and Daly for Pugliarvi. I would say Nyquist and Jensen for Pugliarvi, a cap dump, and a pick. Uh, With, we will retain salary. Yeah. Yarvik7 says, hey guys, this season is turning out as expected. We're playing just bad enough to get beat most nights. Yay for a high draft pick. Here's my question. You've got your choice of three dogs. Chihuahua, Black Lab, and a German Shepherd, which one do you rescue from the pound and why? I choose a Black Lab because Chihuahuas are kind of annoying. Yeah, Chihuahua's not even an option in this scenario. An untrained German Shepherd could be a kind of dangerous thing. Black Labs are so full of love and love food so if much. If you live in an apartment, do not get a Shepherd. No. I'm, I'm leaning towards the Lab just because they are a bit more of an easier dog to train, but I love German Shepherds, so that would be a that would be a coin flip for me at the point of decision. We have a massive field behind our place, so I could just get one of those like ball whippy things, and I could just stand on my porch and just whip that thing and let a German Shepherd run for years. Yeah, yeah I don't have a big enough yard for a Shepherd. Um, Henry Fitz 33 says, considering Tuka Rask's injury, what are the chances Ken might get a call from Boston for Jimmy? Slim. Halak's been playing yeah. really well this year, so it right now isn't even that much of a drop off for them. Uh, and we have time for one more question. Evan, think of a number between one and four. Four. All right. Uh, Nick Lunatic says, longtime listener, despite being a Euro Canuck, I was wondering why you guys are Red Wings fans. It would be cool to hear an origin story since you're good old Ontario boys. Three. <laughs> really hope She's that's... three? <laughs> uh, a, not offensive, B, correct, in C, rooting for an American-based team. Really enjoy the pod. It's been cool to hear growth over time. Keep it up. Well, thank you for uh, supporting us for so long. Who wants to go first? Go on TSN for about one minute, and uh, you'll, under, you'll understand it all. Uh, I honestly wish I had a story. I literally don't remember. I've been cheering them for them as long as my memory goes. I have... Absolutely no clue what got me into the Red Wings when I was a kid. Uh, I was born and raised in Windsor, Ontario, which is right across the border from Detroit. Uh, that town is pretty much split almost down the middle of Detroit and Toronto with the odd Habs fan. Um, my dad, my parents came, immigrated from Iraq in about 1990, and I was born in Windsor, and uh, my dad wanted to get me into, he saw, watched hockey, loved it, wanted to get me into hockey, and had a buddy from work come over and show us, uh, show him like all the gear that I needed. I think his work friends got him into hockey, and a lot of them were Red Wings fans. Hockey that. would truly be the most insane sport to see as someone who immigrated to Canada from a non whole, yeah. non Nordic region of the world. Yeah, like, I would, my mind would be blown. Coming from Iraq, what do you do? Well, we put knives on our feet, and then we take a big stick and we hit this little black thing and each other. Yeah. Okay. The kicker and it's on ice. The kicker is my dad can't skate, has never skated, but. Like knows the game of hockey inside and out. Knows it so well. Oh, like, he should be on Reddit and Facebook. <laughs> no, I want to. <laughs> um, he might be. We don't know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> With that, we're going to wrap small up. Black penis. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, we're going to wrap up this week's episode. As always, here's my spiel. Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. Follow. Go to the bio. Our individual accounts. Follow. 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 Uh, like us on Facebook. Rate us however you get your podcast. Subscribe however you get your podcast. Ratings on iTunes are huge. Um, if you like the show and want to support it further, Patreon's a great way. If you just want to support it, support it by listening. Support it by liking and following. Whatever you want to do. Uh, we are going to see you later this week. Um, and we'll be back then. Hopefully, uh, the Red Wings won't have lost to the Oilers. Or maybe they will. Depends on what, uh, what your thing is. Hopefully, they left a few players in Edmonton. 